everyone, and welcome to All You Need Is Love or Not, an introduction to asexuality, aromanticism, and attraction. We are presenting this at Out and Equals Virtual Workplace Summit 2021. Here's what we'll be talking about today. We'll have uh, introductions from the panelists. That's me and Gina. We'll give you an overview of asexuality and aromanticism and why you should care about these orientations. We'll define love and attraction. We'll go through the spectrums of sexuality and romance. We'll teach you how to be an ally to this community. And we'll answer some frequently asked questions that we get. Just a little bit of a content warning. This uh, presentation contains mentions of suicide, suicidality, sexual assault, violence, and conversion therapy, but it will end shortly. <laughs> So first off, let's introduce ourselves. My name is M. Turner. I work at VMware, and my pronouns are they, them. I firmly identify as the A plus in LGBTQIA+, and it's not because I got good grades in school. It's because I'm agender, asexual, and panromantic. I'm a technical writer at Cloud Health, uh, which is a product at VMware, and my kind of dumb hobby is that I enjoy tough video games. So next, Gina. Hey, my name is Gina Ruth. Um, I am also a technical writer. I am working at Red Hat on the OpenShift container platform. Um, my pronouns are also they, them. And uh, as far as my, my queer identity goes, I, I, I consider myself agender, um, demisexual, and demiromantic. Um, I, for my fun facts, I am a, a big fan of the band Muse and would like to be a circus monkey someday. Awesome. Thanks, Gina. So first, we'll set the stage here, give a little bit of background as to what we're actually talking about in case you've never heard of asexuality or aromanticism in your life. So first, we'll define asexual. Someone who's asexual is a person that does not experience sexual attraction. And on the other hand, aromantic is a person who does not experience romantic attraction. Now, throughout the presentation, I'll probably refer to these two identities with the shorthand ace and arrow. So if you he hear me say that, that's what that means. So let's talk a little bit first about why this is important, especially in the workplace. First of all, this community's identity is still pretty young and their presence is kind of unstable in the LGBTQIA plus community. A lot of people cover their identities or don't feel comfortable being out, maybe don't even identify as LGBTQIA+, even within these so-called safe spaces. Problem is there's a lot of gatekeeping and asexual and aromantic people in particular kind of in a similar place to bisexual people um, with different gender partners. They're seen as functionally straight and so not welcome somehow to the LGBTQ community. And unfortunately, as a result, uh, these identities are systematically oppressed, marginalized, erased, and dehumanized even, uh, just due to lack of understanding and information and education about what these identities are all about. And so a phobia of violence, emotional abuse, slurs, and so-called corrective sexual assault are fairly common. And it's just most people don't believe asexuality or aromanticism exists, which is very sad. And finally, there's no legal protection for this identity. Uh, asexual and aromantic people are not a protected class in most US states. So you could lose your job for being ace, as scary as that is. Uh, there's also the, the issue of marriage con consummation laws. I know this is sort of an outdated law that's being taken off the books in many states, but some states like Alaska say that a marriage can be declared void if a marriage is not consummated. And lastly, with sex ed in our schools, people aren't being taught that it's okay to not want to have sex and that asexuality is completely natural and completely healthy. We just learn that sexuality exists, uh, that people are sexual, but that's not 100% true. Okay, so if we're not supposed to be talking about sex and romance at work, then let's just not, right? Especially at work. But the problem is, is that we live in a very sex and romance focused society, and we just tend to talk about it. It, it's, it seems to come up quite often, especially at work. And so people shouldn't be talking about sexual content at work, it happens. And a lot of times people talk about the sexual content in a way that you might not think about. So for example, you know, I have coworkers that have children and they love their children and that's great. 
uh, and they talk to me and they say, well, it'll all change when you have children. And that makes me feel pretty uncomfortable for a couple of reasons. First of all, is because I identify as non-binary. So they're kind of making an assumption about my genitals there a little bit. And the other problem I have with that is that I identify as asexual. So that's just not something that's ever going to happen for me. And unfortunately that can change my view of my coworkers and my relationship with them. So just know that when you start talking about family and children with somebody, you could be alienating someone or causing discomfort. Now, I wanna be clear here, it's okay to talk about your own family and your children. I'd be happy to listen to that all day, but just don't start assuming things about other people and, and don't start making assumptions about whether they're in a relationship or have children. The other reason that we should talk about ACE identities is because if we refuse to, we're actively erasing these identities. And that can harm people who may be ACE or arrow and don't know it yet. And for a lot of these people, acceptance and understanding can be the difference between life and death. And if you don't believe me, then let's take a look at this 2018 study. In this 2018 study of depression and anxiety among gender and sexual majorities, people who are on the ACE spectrum, which includes asexuals and demisexuals, scored much higher than gay and lesbian people on clinical assessments for depression and generalized anxiety disorder. Now, this is not a test that you wanna score higher on because the higher scores indicate moderate depression. And as to why these people may be scoring higher, I think this quote sums it up really well. If asexual people feel similar pressure to other sexual minorities to conform to heterosexual norms, then it is possible that, that they too may have elevated rates of mental health problems. So TLDR, <laughs> being told your idea of a relationship or what makes you happy is not valid, doesn't make you feel very good. And so I think it's also interesting to point out too that I, I mentioned earlier that bisexual people are in a similar place to, to asexual in the community. Um, and look at how closely these two are on the mental health scores. So clearly people not believing these identities exist and erasing them is not making them very happy. The other thing I want to call out is that this chart doesn't talk about aromantic people, and I think they are probably unfortunately in a worse place, um, but I, I hope that we can get a survey done with them included as well one day. And so the next slide, and this, this will end my content warning after the slide is over, um, but these, this gets a little more serious, and that 43% of cis asexual people have seriously considered suicide and 46% of asexual trans people have actually attempted suicide. That's scary. <laughs> These are the highest rates among the LGBTQ community. And I wanna educate people because it's really changed my life to learn about these identities. And it's really kept me from being one of these statistics. So let's go on to some happier things. Let's talk about love and attraction. So as you're sitting there, I want you to think, how many types of love do you think there are in this big world of ours? How many types of attraction? I know a lot of times we'll think about love, we think about Valentine's Day, we think about kissing and hugging, but there's also family love and there's also your friends, right? So there's, are there different types? Maybe I've, I've listed kind of three, how many? Gina, how many do you think there are? <laughs> I don't know. That's maybe as many as people even, but that might be a little too broad. <laughs> That's a good answer. I like that. So ancient Greek philosophers defined eight distinct types of love. And I want to point out, you know, multiple types of love can be present at the same time. So perhaps that ties into what Gina said a little bit about feeling like there's as many types of love as there are people because it's unique. Each type of love blends together to form a different experience every time. I like it. But let's go through what the ancient Greeks said. The first type of love is Eros. And that's that, you know, kind of Valentine's Day, passionate, fiery love that I was talking about, erotic love. Next is philia, which is an affected, affectionate love. It's the love for your friends or platonic love. And after that, we have storge, which is the familiar love, the love between kinship, kin and family. 
Next is ludus, which is a playful or puppy love, uh, the affection between young lovers. I think some people have a hard time understanding this one, so I just like to put it this way. Imagine that you're back in kindergarten and you have your little kindergarten crush that you played with and you always wanted to go see at recess. That's ludus. You, you all had ludus. Now adults can still have ludus too, but a, a lot of times it's, it's mixed more closely with eros. So people just tend to see it as that type of love. Next up is pragma, which is an enduring love. It's lasted a long time. And I think a lot of people are coming out of the pandemic with these relationships that are really strong because they've had to make it work in quarantine together, right? You've had to endure hardship. And that's something I feel like I've definitely gotten over the pandemic. So one, one nice thing, if there's one nice thing that came out of that, it's that I earned some pragma. Next up, we have agape, which is a selfless and unconditional love. This is a very hard love to attain. And I, I think the good example that I have for this one, recently I saw a commercial for a bank Actually, it was, it was odd. I, I was in a restaurant and I watched it. And um, there's a man helping his elderly mother and in, get into the bathtub. And there was just something so beautiful about that. And so he really just was loving and caring for her and didn't care about anything else, just making sure she was taken care of. And I, I really, I got kind of touched by that. I was like, oh, that is so beautiful. Next up is philosia, which is self-love, but I want to emphasize this is not narcissism. This is not self-love to the extreme. This is a healthy type of love that comes out of building a lot of respect and care for yourself. Next up is mania, and this is my caveat. The, the ancient Greek philosophers said, we need to have at least one bad kind of love, so they made mania. And mania is this obsessive love. It's this love that comes out of kind of trying to fight for survival and, and clinging on to something. Uh, and it's not very good. So I hope that nobody is feeling the mania, but hopefully you can get to a better love soon, right? <laughs> all right, so now I'll have you kind of sit and, and think for yourself. Now that I've gone through all of these types of love, I want you to think about how many distinct types of love you've felt. And the, the key here, you know, as I look through this list for myself, you know, I'm thinking like, I don't know if I've ever felt agape for someone, I'm not really sure. And maybe hopefully I haven't ever felt mania. I, that one, I'm, I'm not too sure. Felosha, I'm working on, you know, you've got to love yourself first. That's what we're all working on. But it's okay. It's natural for people not to feel all of the types of love. And the point is, is that just because asexual and aromantic people don't feel eros doesn't mean they're incapable of love entirely. They can still love in tons of other different ways as we've listed here. Okay, so next let's talk about attraction, which plays a lot into love. First is sexual attraction, which is pretty simply the desire to engage in sexual activities with a person. Next is romantic, which is the desire to be romantically involved with a person. So this is something like going on a date and being a couple and being all lovey-lovey. It's not really about the like holding hands or, you know, being with an attractive person. It's kind of just more of like feeling like you want to be a couple with somebody. Next is aesthetic attraction. And this is an appreciation for a person's appearance. I think about this like looking at art in a museum. You look at the art and you think it's very beautiful. You don't want to touch it because you're not really supposed to. And you don't really want to do anything. You have no feelings that you want to act on about this piece of art. You're just thinking about how beautiful it is and how much you like it. Next up is sensual attraction, which is the desire to engage in sensual, I have to say the S, sensual activities and not sexual activities with a person. What that means is hugging, kissing, cuddling, and for me, I think this is one of the most important uh, types of attraction to, to get a little personal because I, I just like to hug. So if somebody's not a good hugger, there's, there's no attraction there for me. And finally, emotional attraction. Emotional attraction is an attraction that develops based on the emotions or experiences that are shared between two people. Now, a lot, this one's kind of tough to understand too, but think about if, if you've ever been on a date with somebody 
And the first date was great and it was fine. He wanted to meet them again. And then the second date, something just ooh, didn't work out. You didn't really like that second date. You're not sure why. It's because you didn't really form an emotional attraction to that person. You didn't share an emotion or an experience that made you emotionally bonded to them. So again, the point here with this slide is to show just that aromantic and asexual people might not experience all the types of attraction, but that just doesn't mean that they don't experience the other types of attraction. As I just said, I'm very, I find sensual attraction very important. Uh, aesthetic attraction is also pretty important to me. So these, this is uh, what attraction is. Next, let's talk about the spectrum of sexuality and kind of give you a visual of, of how asexual people identify. So here's our spectrum. We have a black end and that represents asexual people because they lack sexual attraction. And on the opposite end are folks that do have sexual attraction or allosexual, also just sexual people. And then in the middle is gray asexuality, but a gray ace might not feel 50-50 like I've depicted it on my little chart here. They could be like 80-20, closer to allo, it could be closer to ace. It really doesn't matter. Any way they want to identify is still validly gray. And last but not least, there's kind of two, two new terms here, and they don't really fit on my pictorial scale, so I put them here. Demisexual is someone who must form a close emotional bond with another person before they have that sexual attraction. It's not a personal choice. It's not something that they're just like, oh, I'm, I'm too picky. No, this is something that just, it's not there unless they have that emotional connection. And meanwhile, fray sexual is kind of the opposite. They only have sexual attraction if there's no bond there. And so let's talk about some of those other new words. I, I talked about fray sexual. This is, again, somebody who experiences sexual attraction only with strangers or before building a bond. Egosexual is somebody who's interested in the thought of sexuality, but not the practice. Lithosexual is somebody who does not want their sexual attraction reciprocated. And quasexual is someone who's unsure of what sexual attraction is and is unsure as to whether they've experienced it. They struggle to differentiate sexual attraction from other types of attraction. So as you can see, there's all sorts of different ways to experience asexuality. And the reason for that is libido and sexual attitudes. So we'll talk a little bit about those. Of course, libido is a sexual drive and that can actually be present for asexual people as well. Just because someone is asexual doesn't mean they have no libido. Now, however, there are different attitudes that asexual people can have towards sex. So that can also affect how they kind of enter relationships, interact with the world. The first type of attitude there seems to be is sex repulsed, which is an asexual who abhors the thought of sex and wants absolutely nothing to do with it. Like, don't even talk about it to them, they're done. Sex indifferent is an asexual person that doesn't really care one way or another about sex, but might be something they just do to make a partner happy, or maybe it feels good when they're stressed out. And finally, there's sex favorable, which is an ace who's open to sex and might actually enjoy it, but they just don't really like go looking for it. They don't desire it as much as somebody who might fully identify as allosexual. And next, let's talk about our flag. I love the flag. It's my favorite. This is the asexual flag. It was created in 2010, and each stripe represents a different aspect of the asexual identity and community. The black stripe represents asexuality. The gray stripe represents gray asexuality and demisexuality. The white stripe represents non-asexual partners and allies. And the purple stripe represents our community and the communities that we live in. And so I like to define a lot of things by what they're not. So we'll just quickly go through what asexual people are not. Asexual people are not celibates. Celibacy is a choice and asexuality is not. Asexuality is just very inherent. It's easy to do. There's nothing hard about it. <laughs> Whereas celibacy from what I understand is, is a little bit more of a difficult lifestyle. 
Asexual people are not all aromantic or lacking attraction to others entirely. They're, though a lot of peop aromantic people are also asexual and vice versa, there's also completely separate people that, you know, like in my case, I'm asexual, but I'm panromantic. I love people. I'm so, I just love being around them. And <laughs> so why would I not be romantically attracted to people? Asexual people are not just suddenly one day disinterested in sex or suddenly lose their libido. I want to emphasize if this happens to you and it bothers you, please do see a doctor about it. I don't want to, I don't want you to have anything wrong. And asexual people are not completely averse re relating to anything about sex. Of course, unless they're sex averse, you know, this is something that's at everybody's comfort level. So I kind of always just say, just avoid the sex jokes with people you don't know. Asexual people aren't just avoiding sex purely out of shame or fear or because of some past trauma. Now, there may be some relation that could be part of the reason why they are, have, are asexual, but this shouldn't be the entire reason. And if you are somebody that, that feels like this is your entire reason that you're asexual, I do encourage you to talk to a therapist if you're not already. Asexuality is not a mental illness. It was in the uh, that just manual of, of mental health disorders for a really long time, but it actually was recently rewritten. So it's it's totally fine if you identify as asexual. It's not a mental illness. There's some problems with how that entry is written, but we will work on that. <laughs> for today, the victory is that we are not mentally ill. Asexual people are also not trying to convert you. That's kind of not the point of this presentation. I'm here just to educate you about this community, let you know that these identities exist. If you are fine with how you are, if you don't want to be asexual, more power to you. <laughs> I'm not trying to convert you. <laughs> and just finally, my last one is kind of a little bit of a joke, but we're also not mushrooms. We don't reproduce asexually. All right, so I've talked a lot about asexuality and I think it's time we hear about the aromanticism end. So I will pass it over to Gina to talk about the spectrum of romance. Yeah, thanks, Sam. Um, so yeah, talking about spectrum of romance or uh, aro people. So similarly to the spectrum that we looked at earlier for sexuality, um, we have a, a similar paradigm here for uh, romantic attraction. So we have on the left side of things, we have aromantic. So this is someone who just does not experience romantic attraction. Um, this is something I related to a lot with like um, movies and stuff growing up. I, I really, and still, I really don't get it. So um Again, moving across the to the other side, we have alloromantic people, and I think this is probably a more uh, a more common mindset where um, you have this sort of like positive feeling about romance and, and experience romantic attraction, um, and so all of these these romantic movies make sense. Um, somewhere in the middle, you have gray romance, right? Gray romantic uh, uh, attraction. So. Again, someone who sometimes experiences this, sometimes doesn't. It's not like um, it could be situational and it could, again, similarly be not necessarily just like right down the middle, but like um, could be any sort of split. Um, we also have some categories uh, that fit outside this strict spectrum. Again, we've got demiromantic. So similar idea to demisexual where you might have these feelings, but only after you've already formed a close emotional bond to someone. Um, and similarly, we have fray romantic who would be someone who is um, not romantically attracted to people whom they've already had a bond with. So, so yeah, going, going down these, uh, the, these uh, similar terms for romantic as we had for the sexuality slides. Um, we've got for romantic I just covered, we've got ego romantic. So someone who's interested in the idea of romance, but not the practice. I think that could make a lot of sense for a lot of people. Like if you like, like a romantic story, for instance, like I think a lot of people like romantic stories and don't necessarily like want that in their life the same way that they read it or whatever. Um, Lithromantic, someone who experiences romantic attraction but doesn't really want that reciprocated. Um, Quaromantic, um, 
this is someone who doesn't really understand like or doesn't uh distinguish between romance and say other types of attraction um so it would be difficult for them to define if they're really experiencing romantic attraction or not so aromantic identities also have a flag um it's got nice shades of green to match our, our green slide earlier um so this one is is more aligned just kind of with a almost aligned with a spectrum right so you've got at the top here you've got um aromanticism um it's the dark green the lighter green is representing that it's a spectrum um the white stripe is representing platonic and aesthetic attraction or queer and quasi-platonic relationships um we have gray again for gray 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 romantic sorry that is a mouthful um and demi-romantic identity and um black to represent the sexuality spectrum and so what I think is cool about this flag is that red is typically the color of romance, right? So green is a cross from red on the color wheel, and that's the opposite color of romance, the aromance color. I, I love that detail. <laughs> I said to add that in. <laughs> yeah, it's good. You can you can always tell like the the graphic design uh, nerds and, and involved in creating pride flags, right? <laughs> so similarly, we got some some interesting misconceptions about people who are aromantic. Um, so aromantic people are not cold and heartless machines and capable of love. Um, I'm pretty aromantic. I love lots of people. I love my cats. It's, you know, it's not really the same thing. Um, aromantic people are also not necessarily asexual or averse to physical affection. These are like different spectrums. These are on different poles. Um, so yeah, those don't really tie into each other necessarily. Uh, it doesn't also mean that you're inherently an introvert or a loner. Um, you could be a real people person and not be particularly romantically attracted to anyone. Um, it doesn't mean you're uninterested in romance in general. So again, with some people like, you know, like these stories, but maybe don't want it for themselves, or maybe it's overwhelming or whatever they feel. Um, and aromantic people that like not being romantic doesn't mean that you're alone or that you're lonely. So now that we've, now that we've introduced the aromantic spectrum and sort of gone through that and some of how there's some parallels to ace identity, um, I'm going to pass it back to M to talk about some ways to describe relationships. Thanks, Gina. Awesome. So yeah, some relationships. Ace and arrow people are in relationships that may not be purely romantic or purely sexual. So we kind of use some different words to describe the objects of our affections and the relationships that we're in. And of course, I'm going to define crush here. I think everybody knows what a crush is, but I, I need it to define the second word. I um, just want to build a good foundation. So a crush is an emotional desire for a romantic relationship that's caused by being romantically attracted to somebody. This can be temporary and never acted on as well. So for those lith romantic and lith sexual people, they might have a lot of crushes. For, next is a squish. And that is an aromantic or platonic equivalent of a romantic crush. It's kind of a, a friend crush, an emotional desire for a platonic relationship that's caused by being emotionally or maybe even sensually attracted to somebody. Um, I think a lot of us actually experience squishes even though we're, we're not ace or arrow. Uh, think about when you get a new friend and you talk about your new friend a lot and you think about them you can't wait to see them oh my gosh my new friend's so cool and they're so pretty right we all have had that i think maybe maybe i'm <laughs> the only weird one but that is a squish next up is queer or quasi platonic relationships so queer platonic quasi platonic relationships and this is a committed relationship that's entirely platonic in nature but People in this kind of relationship could raise children together, share living expenses, or live together long term. It's similar to a marriage, right? And this disrupts the belief that friendships are always, you know, lesser than romance. Also to note is that these types of relationships might not just be two people, it could be more. And finally, we have non-amory, which is a little more applicable to our aromantic folks, but this is somebody that doesn't seek any sort of committed relationship. This is someone who's happy with their existing familiar relationships and their friendships, and they just enjoy the independence that comes with being single. 
who doesn't? <laughs> All right, so let's wrap this up. I'm gonna have Gina ask me some of the questions that we frequently get. So Gina, what's the first question? Yeah, so how do you know if you're asexual or aromantic? I always explain this as it's the same as how you might know if you are gay or lesbian or trans. You, you just know. You know, when I first heard the term asexual and read the definition, oh my gosh, it felt like everything made so much sense. All these light bulbs came on. It's like, this is what I am. And it's perfectly okay and valid for me to feel this way. So to sum it up, you just know. <laughs> and in that case, how can I tell if someone else is asexual or aromantic? That's also a good question, but unfortunately you can't really tell. I'm really sorry. Maybe I wish there was a way to tell a little bit, uh, especially when I was dating, that was tough. But just like you can't tell somebody's gender identity by looking at them, you really can't know whether somebody is ace or arrow just, just by looking at them. And kind of unfortunately, you may never know, but it's their, it's their private life. So just kind of assume that folks might be but be respectful of people's relationships and talking about people's relationships and sex lives. Okay, well, what if you change your mind? Great, okay, I'm, I'm waiting. I'm waiting for my mind to change. No, I'm just kidding, I'm not anymore. But what if a straight cis person, you know, decided one day that they wanted to be a gay trans person? I mean, people change their mind about things. It, it happens and it happens slowly over a long time or it, it may look like it happened suddenly, but people do change their minds and that's okay. Um, though I will say, you know, most of the shifts I see within kind of the ace and arrow spectrum are people that say, well, I, I identify as gray sexual now, but maybe later I talk to them and they say, no, I identify fully as asexual or, you know, any of these shifts. As for myself, um, I have been identifying as asexual for 10 years plus now. I don't really know if I'm going to change my mind anytime soon. Uh, like I said before, sometimes wish I would, <laughs> wish I could, it would make the living in the world so much easier, but uh, I really don't think my mind's just going to suddenly change, and that's also perfectly okay. All right, well, that's all well and good, but why do asexual or aromantic people want to be out about this? Like, do I need to know about this really? Yeah, you know, all we really want is to not be marginalized and not to be erased or forgotten about or, or dehumanized even because this way of living and way of thinking is, is not normal. Um, and the easiest way that we can be forgotten about and, and talked over and abused, frankly, is to hide our identities. But when we're out and we're backed up by allies saying, no, this is totally fine. This is a normal thing. It's very hard to be forgotten about and it will eventually become more normal. So thank you for that, Gina. I wanna take one last question that we often get and I am going to give two whole slides to this because it's a really important question. And that's why should the LGBTQIA community support the ACE community? And I'm gonna start off the answer to this question by asking you a question first. Do any of these lines sound familiar? Oh, you'll change your mind about women someday. You're not bi, you're dating somebody who's the same gender as you, come on. Non-binary, oh, it's not even a real gender identity. Transgender women aren't real women. You heard any of these horrible things? Now let's see the ace perspective. Well, you'll change your mind about sex. You'll change your mind about dating people one day. Don't worry, it'll happen. You can't be asexual. You can't be aromantic. You're dating somebody. How does that work? Aromanticism, that's not a real sexual identity. Asexuality, huh? What's that? Asexual people, they're not even human. Aromantic people aren't even human. Yeah, we get it. We know. <laughs> And so that's why I'm here to say that we really do need the support of the LGBTQIA plus community. And the reason for that is we face a lot of the same issues. We have people that question whether our identities exist or whether they're valid ways of identifying. We have people that think there's something wrong with us. And we have feelings of shame and isolation for our identities. 
the LGBTQIA plus community is perfectly positioned to support the ACE community because they understand the process of coming out and exploring these non-normative relationships that we have. So we need to support each other. We need to magnify each other's visibility and back each other up to make everything more normal and everything better for everyone involved. So hopefully that's inspired people to start to wonder, how can you be an ally? I'm gonna walk you through a few things you shouldn't do first. I'm a Debbie Downer. Don't assume everyone is sexual or romantic. Just don't do it. Don't call someone asexual or romantic unless they've explicitly told you, hey, that's how I identify. Because um, the reason for this is we don't want to make somebody like it's a joke or, you know, it's like calling somebody gay is a slur, right? We don't want to make people the butt of a sexual joke or make sexual remarks. It's not a way to be a good ally. Not a way to be a good ally to anybody, really, <laughs> even outside the ace community. Don't push the topic of a person's sex life or romantic life. I was in this conversation kind of recently, and I'm going to tell you, even though it happened with people I'm close friends with, it was not comfortable to try to get out of that conversation. So just don't do it. <laughs> don't assume that a person does or doesn't want to be in a romantic relationship or does or doesn't want to be a parent. Now, this is a little confusing because I'm saying, you know, don't assume that everybody wants to be asexual or everybody is asexual, but just have respect for people's boundaries. Maybe they are fine in a relationship. They'll tell you about it. Maybe they don't want to be in a relationship. They might not tell you about it, but talk about something else. There's a lot of things to talk about. Next is don't feel sorry. Don't feel worried for somebody in the ACE community unless they're like explicitly coming to knock on your door and say, hey, I'm having trouble. Help me. Um, we're pretty happy. We're fine when we're allowed to exist and we're seen. Uh, so don't feel like it's something that you have to feel bad about. And finally, this is good advice in general, maybe a little bit tangential to the point of this talk, but don't pressure anyone into anything they want to, don't want to do. Uh, I mean, I just think it's, it's good advice. That's why I share it, because a lot of ACE people may not feel like they're in a place where they could deny somebody. A lot of Arrow people may feel like they have to go out with somebody just because their parents want them to. So don't push people into something that they don't want to do. And Gina, do you want to talk us through how to be a good ally? Yeah, got some suggestions of things you might do instead. Um, so yeah, if someone if someone has been so uh, comfortable with you as to open up about their ace or arrow identity, listen to them. I think this can be really difficult for everyone. If you are experiencing or if you're encountering a viewpoint or a way of being that is different from your own, it can be really hard not to just like try to put it in the framework of how you experience life. Um, so yeah, l listen to what they're saying and believe them. And then this sort of ties right into like, you know, be supportive of them. Um, you know, it's, it's second guessing someone or uh, like questioning them is not, is not super helpful. It's not supportive. So just, you know, meet, meet them where they are and, and accept that. It's good to acknowledge that asexuality and aromanticism are valid identities. Um, even that can go a long way. I think just like when someone comes to you with something and you're like, oh, I, I know about that, you know, like I don't get it, I don't understand it, whatever, but I know about that. It, that's that can help a lot. Um, just people feeling more comfortable in the world. Um, respect people's privacy. Uh, you know, we've kind of gone on on the subject a, a decent amount where um there's a lot of, it's, it's sort of assumed to be uh, reasonable questions to ask a lot about other people's relationship statuses, but people might not want to talk about it. And it might not just be because of shyness, they might be outing themselves. They not, might not be ready for that. So just respect folks' privacy. Um, you can advocate for awareness, education, and inclusion. That's a big one. Um, the more people who know about these identities, the less likely it is that someone is going to experience uh, a negative reaction or like having to go through this whole um, explanation with like, you know, every person they meet and get close to and, and want to talk on this level. Um, also discuss boundaries with your partners. That's, I mean, again, that's just kind of a general good point, but like, don't, you know, don't assume that like every relationship that you, especially like new relationships, um, 
and stuff, like don't assume that every relationship is going to go a certain way. I think it's really good to be clear and communicate about this kind of thing. Awesome, those are great tips, Gina, thank you. So that about wraps up our presentation, but I do wanna leave you with some reading and resources that you can do on your own if you're still curious in, in doing some more research. So first up is, is AVEN, which is the Asexual, Asexuality Visibility and Education Network. This is where a lot of us ace folk got our start. I know I found out about asexuality there myself. We also have the Movement for Asexuality, Awareness, Protection, Learning, and Equality, short to MAPLE at this website. Asexual Outreach is another good community. And it's October, which means that Asexual Awareness Week is coming up. That is October 24th through 30th this year. So very exciting. Do uh, spread the word and let others be aware of asexuals. Uh, we have Unicorn March, which is where a lot of my graphics came from in this presentation. And then I, uh, this issue of psychology and sexuality focuses specifically on asexuality. So it's a really interesting read if you're interested in that from a psychology, psychology angle. And thanks again for joining everyone. And I hope you enjoy the rest of Out and Equal.